amazing, godly, humble worship team. Can we thank them for leading us to the throne of grace and mercy? All right, so if you are a first time guest, if you're here physically, or if you are watching online from anywhere around the world, can we give a huge Transformation Church welcome to all of our guests? Thank you for being here. Next, let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our Correctional Facilities Partnerships, which, hold on, hold on, is 400 of them in 40 states. Let's give it up. Welcome, 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 welcome. And to the TC family, it is so, so good to see you. And we're going to wrap up our sermon series, Feast. We've been walking through feasting on grace, feasting on love, and we're going to talk about on Resurrection Sunday, feasting on mercy. Now, teenagers, put this in your pocket because you're going to need it. Easter can be said this way. Jesus came to pick a fight, but he did not come to fight you. Jesus was sent to fight for you. Oftentimes, and for those of you who don't follow Christ yet, oftentimes we present it as though Jesus is angry at sinners. No, no, no. Jesus came to free sinners from the clutches of the great enemy. So when I was growing up, I had a cousin named Daryl, and uh, one time some people wanted to mess with me. I was a little tender-hearted little fellow, <laughs> and Daryl was like, I got you. I'll go take your place in the fight. Well, Daryl could swing them hands. I'm not saying that's what you need to do, because Jesus said, you know, the other cheek and all that stuff, but Daryl was on another program. <laughs> and on that particular occasion, I was glad. So Daryl fought for me. Well, there's an enemy that you and I cannot defeat. And here's the enemy. He fought and defeated your enemy and my enemy, sin and death. His weapon of victory is mercy. Now, let me pause here because even as people who know the Bible, we can lose the meaning of words. So the word sin was not a word that Christians invented. It was not a word that the ancient Jews invented. It was a term that was actually used in archery. If there was a competition, an archer would get a bow and arrow and shoot at the target, and if it missed the bullseye, it missed the mark, it was called sin. You missed the mark. Well, I've never shot a bow and arrow. However, I do fish because Jesus said, and I will make you a fisher of fish, I mean of men. So, I know where the bass like to hide, particularly this time of year, in the pre-spawn. And I get my open face reel with my braided test line, and it has to be yellow because that's my favorite color. And I know how to get right where them bass are hiding so a brother can pull them up out the water. Now, sometimes I miss my mark. That's called sin. You miss the mark. Well, what is the mark for people? The mark for people is not other people. So I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up in church. So automatically, number one, I am fighting for love. I am fighting for identity. I'm fighting for significance. I'm fighting for purpose. And in the midst of fighting those battles that I can never win, I make myself good or bad based on what other people do. And so what I did is what you do is we start with this self-salvation. You're like, what do you mean? Self-salvation just means this. Where am I finding love? Who am I trying to win to love me? How do I get an identity? How do I find purpose? How do I find significance? And so it breeds into self-righteousness or self-loathing. Time out. Guys, if you don't think this is true, why is there so many self-help books? The self-help book industry is expensive exploding. It's all over TikTok. It's all over Instagram. And here's the thing is we can't help ourselves. Self-righteousness says, I'm good. I don't need God. I can figure this out. Even church people, you do know that there can be people who attend a church on the weekend who don't know Jesus, the originator of the church. And it's like, well, I'm a good person. But then there's self-loathing of going, well, I just messed up too much. But notice, self-righteousness inflates your ego. Self-loathing 
deflates your ego. Either way, ego is still there, which stands for edging God out. But Jesus came so that you and I could finally rest from trying to save ourselves. Now, hear my heart in this. We should be physically fit as best that we can and do the best that we can. But for some of us, we're trying to be physically fit because we're trying to save ourselves. Maybe somebody will love me. Maybe somebody will like me. Maybe I will fit in. People laughed at me when I was a kid. All of us are doing all these things to save ourselves. And there's only one person who goes, I'm already impressed with you. I created you. I, I just want you to allow me to love you. But this thing called sin, it's not just an action, it's a condition that Jesus came to defeat with mercy. So teenagers and young adults, and those of you exploring, following Jesus, King Jesus defeated sin for you and me. How did he do it? Hebrews chapter one, verse three. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but we know that he liked coffee because Hebrews. I know, I can't help it. I can't just, every time, this is a terrible preacher joke. But here's some profound scripture. Check this out now. The son, this is speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the eternal son of God. He's eternal along with the father and the Holy Spirit making the triune God. The son is the radiance of God's glory. So Jesus himself is the standard of what humanity was meant to be. Think about how precious and how good God is. You and I are fumbling around. We're lost going, what does life look like? And God goes, let me show you. I'm going to come and show you. There was a song years ago that went like this. What if God was one of, well, he was. And when Jesus came for 33 years, he simply loved in a way that the world has never seen. That, that he is God's glory. God's glory is not something just out there. God's glory is when humanity is rightly connected to him. So Jesus goes, hey, y'all, this is what it looks like to really be human. And what I want to do is I want to defeat sin so you can begin your journey to make humanity great again. Oh, y'all didn't pick up what I'm laying down. If we want to make something great again, let's make humanity great again. And the way humanity becomes great again, to greatly love, to greatly serve, to greatly forgive. Can you imagine forgiving like Jesus for just one minute? Can you imagine telling somebody, but I say, bless your enemies and love them? Can you imagine what kind of world that would be? Well, Jesus goes, I don't want you to imagine it. I want to defeat sin so you can actually live it. The exact representation of his being, if you ever want to know what the God of the Bible is like, look to Jesus. He is the living portrait of the living God. God is so gracious, he shows us what God looks like, and he shows us what humanity could be in the person of Jesus. Sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. What's happening here? Purification. That is a deeply Jewish word. If you go to Israel now, you'll find these uh, holes in the ground that were called mikvahs. And so ancient Jews would go into them to clean themselves. The water was not replaced, but they would go in and out continuously. Whole story for another time. <laughs> there was this cleanliness. Because God is pure, we have to be pure. So God, who's gracious and kind, says, here's the standard. You don't reach it, but I'm going to reach you with love. And on the cross, Jesus is not only going to forgive your sins. Now, let me make this really personal. Think of what you've done and what I've done that no one else knows about, that you would be ashamed about. Jesus says, in my blood, not only is it erased, it is forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, it is removed. I remember it no more. But he's not done yet. He actually purifies us. What does that mean? He forgives us and he cleans us. In 1994, I won the RCA Man of the Year for the Indianapolis Colts. I would go speak at schools and I would do a lot of stuff. And it was self-salvation. I wanted people to look at me a certain way. It was self-salvation. It was like taking a shower and the more I scrubbed, the more I realized how impure I was. 
There's only one shower that can take away the impurities, and it's a shower where you stand under the flood of his blood, and he washes you anew, and it is free. You ain't even got to pay the water bill. It is the eternal spring. It is free. You want to stop living with game, uh, shame and guilt? receive it. To sit down at the right hand means this. It is a Hebrew idiom that when a king won a battle, he would go back to his kingdom, to his throne room, and sit down. Jesus sat down. It is finished. The Greek word is to tell us that. It is finished. Question, if Jesus finished, why are you working so hard and exhausted? It takes a lot of humility to let someone else rescue you. Would you let him do what he does best? Defeat sin in your life. Not only the penalty of it, but the power of it. You can actually be different. You don't have to be a perpetual womanizer just because your dad was and your uncles knew. No, you don't have to be. You don't have to live in perpetual fear. You don't, you don't have to be a liar. You, you, you don't have to be those things. You know why? Because the king has defeated sin. Trust him. It's going to feel a little insecure, but trust him. His nail-pierced hands are big enough to hold you and to walk with you and to carry you. He is great enough. Feast, feasting on mercy means this, teenagers. King Jesus defeated death for you. He defeated death. Oh, okay. Whew, I'll see if I can make it through this one. That's me. That was me in my Brigham Young days. This is 1992, first game of the season. We're playing at the University of Texas at El Paso, i.e. UTEP. And these are my grandparents. And uh, they had never seen me play a game in person. So my granddad, who worked every day, we finally got convinced, okay, go see him play. So in Texas, San Antonio to El Paso is eight hours. Eight hours from here, we'd be like in top of the Atlantic Ocean or something, right? Texas is just huge. So anyway, they made it. And man, gosh, it ain't nothing like a grandmother's love. Any, anybody know about that granny love? Man, listen. Uh, my mom was 17 when she had me. My dad was 19. From about middle school on, I lived with my grandparents. My, my, my grandmother and I had a very, very special and unique bond. I was the first grandchild. Uh, we were so, so tight. So I went to college in 1989. Every day until she died, we talked on the phone. And I'm quite sure Vicky was like, mm, that's probably a little unhealthy. And it was. I get that. But man, we were so close. My love for fishing, granny. When there, I, she protected me from stuff I didn't even know existed. So for some of you teenagers and preteens and you're like, what's going, you don't even know how you've been protected. You're not old enough to handle it yet. There are things that adults protect you from that you don't even know about. So slow your roll, don't get, bit, get too big for your britches. But that's what my grandmother did for, for me. In 2005, I called home and uh, 661-057-8210. And um, guys, there's still times where I pick up the phone to call her and she's been gone since 06. Um, I called and she didn't sound right. And by that time, I had been in ministry and uh, I had been with people who were getting ready to cross the finish line and move to eternity. And so all the signs were there, but when it's somebody else, you can step into it and you do your pastor role, but when it's you, you're like, wait a second, so this is happening. So I had to fly to San Antonio for two and a half weeks. For people who don't believe in hell, I experienced hell. It, it was, I walked into a room and my grandmother was emaciated, from cancer, it, it was just, I'm not blaming anybody. It was just, it was, it was awful. So I had to take her to the hospital. I had to get her in the hospice. By the way, 
she wouldn't go to the hospital till I showed up. When I walked in the room, she said, oh, there's my doctor. There's Dewey. So she only went to the doctor because I made her go. But by then, it, 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 was, it was way too far. So we had to get her in hospice. And I remember cleaning out her room, and I walked past the closet, and I saw my high school letter j- j- jacket. And I was too sad to cry. There was no tears. A part of me died. Vicky was worried about me. She had my mentor call me like, hey, man, I'm coming to get you. I'm like, no, no, I can walk through it. It was two weeks, and I knew I had to come back home because I had to care for my wife and my kids. Eventually, I preached her funeral, and y'all, I had such a joy. The only way I can explain that joy is I knew this, that on the third day. Early in the morning in Jerusalem, the king of glory walked out of that tomb and he called my grandmother's name with him. But not only my grandmother's name, but everybody else who is called on his name. You see, physical death and the dark powers may put a comma at the end of a story or a semicolon, but God is the one who puts a period and an exclamation point and writes new chapters. Death does not have the final word, and when I preached that sermon, I had joy because in that casket was not my grandmother. My grandmother was with Jesus, and one day I will see her again with a resurrected body in a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus does not just save your soul. He's going to save all of creation. Death has been defeated. Now, one day you're going to, have a, you're going to hear a terrible rumor about me. I want to prepare you now. And the rumor is going to say this. Have you heard? Pastor Derwin is dead. Do not believe them for one second. Because the God that I worship... Said in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection, I am the life. Though you die, you will live. Do you believe this? Yes, I do. Amen. Family, look at this. Where am I getting this from? Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. That's the doctrine of the incarnation. A Latin word means that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became one of us. For only as a human being he could die. Isn't it amazing that Jesus is our representative? I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine you're guilty of all types of crime. You are broke. You cannot afford a lawyer. And your father, who you haven't heard from because you haven't picked up the phone to talk to him, you finally do. And he says, don't worry about it. I'm sending you an attorney. Now, look, he's not going to look impressive. Matter of fact, he's going to be look bloodied and beaten. He's not going to have on a Gucci suit. He's going to have on a robe. He's not going to have on a Rolex. He's going to have nail piercings in his side. And he's never lost a case. He's going to represent you. Well, Jesus in his humanity says, Dad, Everything that's true about me is now true about them because I represent them. His death was in your place to give you grace to create space in his family. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. I wish I was there when Satan was like, wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. What happened? He did what? Man, you better go check that tomb. We did. He ain't there. That's how the dark powers are broken, is by the light of life. You know what? Some of you right now are in darkness. And it's your fault. One of the freest days of your life is when you stop blaming everybody else. Nobody has hurt you or me more than you and me. Take ownership and say, Lord, I'm in a dark place, and I need you to resurrect life in me. Only in this could we, could, 
he set free all who lived their lives as slaves to fear of dying. Feasting on mercy means this. King Jesus made you alive and seated you in the heavenlies with himself. Now, the Apostle Paul, this Jewish man, one of the early leaders of the church, is going to give an autopsy of the human condition. Teenagers, an autopsy is when a doctor will study the dead body to figure out why they died. Well, here's why you and I are born spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. He says, as for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins. The word trans means beyond. Gressions means the law. So I'm not proud of this, teenagers. Don't do this, okay? Don't do what I did when I was 17. So uh, I got like seven speeding tickets in a year. <clears throat> There's a speed limit, and I went over it. That's called transgression. I transpassed the law. Well, God has a law. It's called Torah. It's love God, love your neighbors, love yourself. That's what it boils down to. And all of us have ran over that. We've all transgressed. Listen, if you follow Jesus, we should be the most humble people on the planet because we know that if it's not by the grace of God, there go us. Can we please stop asking non-Christians to live like Christians? That's like trying to eat a fish you have not caught. How did Jesus convince people? He met them. He loved them. He wooed them. He shared his life with them. He didn't pick up signs to pick at them. Oh, my God, he picked up a cross to save them. Y'all ain't picking up what I'm putting down. It is a lot harder to live by grace than it is to condemn. And oftentimes when we condemn other people, it's because that's what we see in ourselves. <laughs> I am so glad in the mid 90s when I was in the NFL locker room cussing and acting a fool, my Christian teammates wasn't like, dude, clean your act up, bro. No, they were like, hey man, what's going on inside of you? Like, 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 Help me understand. Like, they asked questions, and they loved me, and they, they prayed for me when I was acting a fool. It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and a ruler of the kingdom of the air. Check this out now. This is a hard truth. There is no, hey, you know what? I'm going to sit this battle out between Jesus and Satan. If you think you're sitting it out, you're on Satan's team. There is no... It's either light or darkness, and he came to pick a fight for you. The spirit who is it now at work in those who are disobedient. The autopsy is not looking good, y'all. It is not looking good. Oh, let me come back to verse 4. I'm sorry I missed that. Thank you. Verse 4. Whew, I'm glad we get into the anecdote. But because of his great love for us, Notice it doesn't say because you fixed yourself, because you cleaned yourself, because you've done really good, because you're an awesome human being. It says, no, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. If I can just feast on mercy for a minute, would you indulge me for a moment? God's mercy was not affected by the recession of 08 and before COVID. Here's why. Because God is infinite. Teenagers, infinite means this. You can't measure him. You can't quantify him. If you could measure or quantify him, he wouldn't be God. You can only measure that which was created. And God is the uncreated creator because his being is infinite. His mercy is infinite, which means this. It is new every single morning. And you can ask and ask and ask. And he does not get tired of hearing from you. It ain't over yet. <laughs> because of his great love and mercy, what did he do? He made us alive. That's the Greek word zoe. It's God's kind of life. God says, I'm going to make you born again with resurrection life. I'm going to pull you out of that spiritual tomb, out of that physical tomb, and I'm giving you life now with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you've been saved. Listen. 
I know some of you were raised in such a way that you had to earn love. You, you had to do things to be seen and you had to act in certain ways and you want to think that God treats you that way. He doesn't. Remember, it was his idea to come for you. It was his idea to die on the cross. It was his idea to wake you up when you were asleep. It was his idea. He's the one person in the universe you don't have to impress. Let me put it to you this way. He says, take your resume and burn it. He says, take your resume and burn it because my son is enough for you. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? So, when we say yes to Jesus, forgiven of sin, purified, we're loved, mercy. It says that we are seated right now with Jesus in the heavenly realms. When he rose from the dead, he went back into the realm of heaven and he's praying over us. So if Jesus is there, wherever there is, and we're here, how are we there and here? Maybe this illustration will help. Transformation Church, you may not know this, but there are congregations in Norway that are watching what God is doing here to create this multi-ethnic family. You're like, Norway, hmm, very tall blonde people. <laughs> True, however, there are people coming from all over the world to Norway, from Latin America, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, India, and they love Jesus and they're going to Norway and this multi-ethnic group of people that love Jesus are like, well, where do we connect in a church? Because the Norwegian church is eh, dead and those who are alive in Christ are going, pastor, will you help us? So Transmate Church, you're discipling congregations in Norway and how to love like this, and you may not know it. So on this Easter Sunday, I'm going to let you know. But check this out. The other day, I actually preached a sermon in Norway, but I was here. How? Technology. If human beings have tech like that, imagine the tech that the God of the resurrection has. We are seated in the heavenlies and here with him. So here's what that means. Here's what that means. It means this, that resurrection power means new resurrection possibilities. Teenagers, I want to prophesy over you right now. When I was your age, I thought all I could do was play football. I was a stutterer. You could, I didn't know what a church was. I didn't know what a pastor was. But one day I met Jesus and he told me who he was. How in the world can a compulsive stutterer be up here preaching to you right now? Resurrection power. The first wedding I went to was my own at 21. How does that happen? Almost 32 years later, you're still married resurrection power. So I'm here to tell you there is new hopes, there is new possibilities, there is new power when you're seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. There is new power for your marriage, new power for your singleness, there's new power, there's new hope, there's generational curses that can be broken. The King of glory is sufficient and He is able. He's able. He's able. How do I know? because he's done it to me. One of the things that I learned from the young kids, because I like to feel young, you know what I'm saying, is this concept called keeping receipts. Well, Jesus keeps receipts. Matter of fact, it looks like this. The receipt is called Jesus paid it all. Your sin paid it all. Your shame paid it all. Your pain paid it all. Your past mistakes paid it all. Rejection and loneliness paid it all. Slavery to sin paid it all. Spiritual death paid it all. Amount due, zero. Change due, subtitle. Grand total is zero. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the God that we serve. He's a resurrected king. He's glorious. That's who we serve on this Sunday morning.
All right, family, be seated. By the way, if you're like, what are they so excited about? They know Jesus and you'll do the same thing. Okay, quick, quick, this is the 11, I can take a little bit more time or whatever time it is, this is the last one. So when I was beginning to get close to Jesus, I was like, okay, this is making sense, but I am not gonna be one of those people that cry in the service. I'm not gonna be one of those people that raise their hands. That's just weird. <laughs> but then I met him and I've never seen anyone more beautiful. So this is what's gonna happen. Our music team is gonna lead us in a song, but this song is a part of my sermon. And when I get back, I'm gonna ask you to grab a connection card. And if you prayed with me to receive Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to fill that card out and I'm gonna ask you to hand it to our hospitality team so that we can begin to help you grow in your faith. It is time for some of us to come to the altar.
Pray with me. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you walked out of that tomb and vindicated that you were the true Lord, the good news is that the true Lord has defeated sin and death. And all those who trust him will walk in the shadow of his eternal life, a part of his people, his community. Forgiveness has been paid for. Death has been defeated. Life is given. Right now in this moment, I'm asking you this question. Have you taken the nail-pierced hands of Jesus and said, Lord, will you save me? I want to be forgiven of all my sin. I want to be purified. I want to know your grace and mercy. I want to know your great love. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want the power of darkness to be broken by the power of light in my life. Today is your day, friend. Would you come to Jesus? I'm not asking you, are you religious? I'm asking you, have you bowed your knee to him and said, I choose to follow you today. I'm tired of trying to save myself. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Where you are right now, pray this to him. Today, King Jesus, I bring all of my sin and hurt and brokenness to your cross. And I receive your purification, your forgiveness, and your love. I believe that should have been me hanging there, but love made you choose to be there. I believe that your body lay in a tomb for three days, but on the third day you rose again to give me new eternal life and a new power to be seated with you in the heavenlies. I am yours and you are mine, and I am now a part of your people, a part of your family. I couldn't earn this. I couldn't achieve it. It is so great of a gift. I can only receive it by faith, and I do so. I commit all the days of my life to walk with you. In your name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Yeah, would you be seated? In a moment, um, Christelle is going to come out to conclude the service, but before she does, if you prayed with me, grab the connection card in the seat in front of you and fill it out. Put on there, I prayed to receive Christ, or I renewed my faith in Christ. Give it to our hospitality team as you are leaving, and then we'll get in touch with you to begin to help you grow in your faith. If you're watching online on TV, there's going to be this big old QR code. Grab your smartphone, open up the camera app, point it at the QR code. It's going to take you to the connection page. Let us know you pray to receive Christ. We want to nurture you. We want to care for you. We want to shepherd you. We want to help you grow in your newfound faith or if you have recommitted your faith. Okay? Please take time to do that. Our soul tattoo, for those of you that are our guest, the new soul tattoo is, what, what do we take away? What's the thought that we can have throughout the week to remind us of this message? Here it is, feast on mercy. And how do we do that? Listen to this sermon over and over, on your way to work, on your way to school, when you're working out. Do the study questions on the TC website. Do them in community, do them alone, do them with friends. Let it just wash all over you because when we experience God's mercy, we become merciful people. 
Our action step is this, join us next Sunday for a brand new sermon series called Grow By. I'm not gonna tell you by what, you gotta come back next week, but it's gonna be epic, God wants us to grow. Love you guys, can y'all welcome Christelle?